at all. Let's do it. All right, three, two, one. Say, hey, good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, or good evening, or good night. <laughs> God be praised. Welcome to the first ever worldwide Bible class. Uh, glad you could join us. Let's see. I think some people are still joining audio. Some people so. are jumping in? Yeah. 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 Hey, Sahari, I see you. You made it. We can, while we wait a few minutes, uh, uh, but this will be really good because Sahar is there in Tel Aviv, so he can give us the uh, report on the ground from Israel. So, well, welcome everyone. I think it, we're still having people jump in. It's, uh, it seems like uh, people are joining us here. So, so I'm Pastor Brian Wolf. there. If you, if you don't, uh, welcome to this experiment. Thanks for being part of it. Uh, the first ever, as far as, well, I, I, our first ever try at the worldwide Bible class. Um, so a couple of things to uh, talk about before we, um, before we get going. Um, so one, and you guys are probably in a couple of people emailing me all morning about like the dangers of, of zoom. And so we want to be kind of careful on this. Um, we're going to, we're going to re be record first. We're going to record the Bible study today. So just so you guys know that it, it shouldn't record or capture your video for that video, but um, so you know that we're recorded so that if you do jump on or you do say something, um, that'll, that'll be in the internet forever. So, so be aware of that. I think we mostly want to handle the, the, uh, questions today through the chat. So there's a chat feature. If, if you look at the bottom of your page and, and, uh, you can see a little chat thing and you can open that up. Um, we have it set to where you can chat with myself or with Evan, who's also hosting the meeting. Um, so if you have a question or any comments or something like that, you want to jump in, um, we're going to prefer the chat today. Maybe as depending on how things go, we might have people raise their hand and jump in and say some more, uh, after this as well, but we'll prefer the chat for questions. Uh, Evan Hine is the co-host of the meeting. And so he's going to handle like all the behind the scenes stuff and the technical stuff. Evan, do you want to introduce yourself and say hello? Hey guys, thanks everybody for joining. Appreciate it. If you have a question, uh, please just send it to me in the chat and then uh, I can moderate those at the right time. Uh, so that, so that's fantastic. And if you have any questions about, um, about what we're doing or uh, any biblical questions, you can send those either to Evan or to me also. Uh, and we'll, and we'll try that as well. Um, I'll be, I'll be looking forward to getting feedback on how this is and how helpful it is and everything else like that. Uh, as we go through the meeting, uh, as we go through the Bible study, and as we finish up as well, so so that'll be great. Um, so I'm gonna sh I'm gonna go ahead and just a, kind of a couple of ground rules, if I could. Um, and hopefully, let's see if I'm sharing the screen here. Uh, the uh, a couple things to remember: we're gonna record Bible class. We want to encourage your questions, um, and I the way I'd like to do it is. We'll study for a little bit. I'll stop and see what questions you have. We'll kind of dig into it a little bit more. Uh, and then as the class goes, we'll get looser and looser. So if you have questions about the particular text that we're studying or the thing that we're thinking about, that, that'll be great for the beginning. If you, anything, though, by the time we get to the end, I'm ready for questions about uh, whatever. We might call on some people if we recognize you and know you, uh, knowing that we got maybe some uh, new faces and new friends joining us for Bible class. You're very welcome. So probably, again, we'll prefer the chat uh, for today. I think that's all the announcements. So we will start with a prayer. In fact, we have two prayers. We'll pray the prayer for the word and uh, the collect for the word and then the collect for Holy Tuesday. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you, was, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and inwardly digest them, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, grant us grace so to pass through this holy time of our Lord's passion that we may obtain the pardon of our sins through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
Well, a couple uh, to start. We're going to study today. Our topic will be the uh, the chronology of Holy Week, and so we want to. This will be at least you know we'll do this this week, and I think next week I'm I'm interested in starting an exploration of the topic of hope. It seems like that's like maybe more than ever in this life uh, something that we need. But but I want to. We're on Holy Tuesday and Holy Week, and I always think it's nice to sort of get oriented to the events of of holy week uh especially during this time uh one of the things that um that the church year does if you think of the church year and the calendar of the church year it it expands and contracts the life of jesus so in fact the whole church year like think about advent and christmas and epiphany and then on into lent holy week easter and everything else like this it's like taking the apostles creed and saying it really slow so it takes a whole it like it takes a whole year to say the apostles creed so we have the birth of jesus the prophecy of jesus the birth of jesus the life of jesus the suffering of jesus the death and burial of jesus and then the resurrection of jesus the ascension and as we're waiting for him but but one of the other things that happens in the church here is that at very important times it'll it'll kind of go in actual time so uh, um we watched a couple of years ago, I don't know if any of you guys saw that, that movie 24 or the TV show 24, which was where it was like half, all the events are happening in real time. Well, that's kind of what the church does uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to Holy Week. It's like events that are happening are happening in real time. So, so Palm Sunday actually was the Sunday before Easter. So last Sunday, two days ago, we had Palm Sunday. And then we have all the events of Holy Week occurring and, and on the particular days, and we can track those days. In fact, the traditional Treore service, the three-hour service on Good Friday, is from noon to three on Good Friday. And those were the three hours that Jesus was in darkness hanging on the cross. So, so the events of Holy Week are sort of happening in real time, so we can consider them. But I want to start with this assertion. And that is that, um, that, and let me share my screen again here, that events of Holy Week are, so, uh, are to be understood as the most important events in the history of the world. And to make that case, I just want to show you this. This is, I think, an amazing thing um, for, to consider. And that is that, that of the Gospels that deal with the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, there's a huge percentage of the gospel, of the time in the gospel, given over to the last week of Jesus' life. Now, you can track this by, for example, just considering when does Palm Sunday happen in the gospels? Because Palm Sunday is the event that marks the last week of Jesus' life. So that Matthew 21 gives us the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. So that so that now, just imagine this, that the last seven chapter, the last eight chapters, I should say, the last eight chapters of, uh, of the Gospel of Matthew, the last six chapters of the Gospel of Mark, the last six chapters of the Gospel of Luke, and the last 10 chapters of the Gospel of John have to do with the last seven days of Jesus' life. So, so th this is, oh, this is, no, sorry, Mike, I ordered a little like a drawing pad that will, so I'll be able to draw to where it doesn't look like I'm drawing with a crayon with my left hand. But until that comes, you got to endure this sort of thing. But the, so that the, 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 there's these huge chunk of time that the gospel writers give to the last seven days of the life of Jesus. In fact, so I worked out the percentages. Let me see, maybe I'll type this out. The percentage of the, of the gospel given to the last seven days is 28% of the Gospel of Matthew. It's 37% it's of the Gospel of Mark. It's 25% of the Gospel of Luke. And it's 47.5% of the Gospel of John. This is the per, these are the percentages that, that the Gospel writers give to to the just to the last seven days of the life of Jesus. Now that's a, you can see that half of the gospel, which is the gospel, by the way, that tells us that the ministry of Jesus was three and a half years. That almost half of it is on these last seven days. 
So there's perhaps no other time in the life of our Lord Jesus, uh, there's probably no other time in, in the history of the world, no other events that are as, as important as these last days. So, so, we'll, so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Now, to get us oriented, uh, I want to look at a couple of maps if we can do this. So, so here's one, one map, a picture of Jerusalem in the ancient world. I want to kind of highlight this, and I might show you a little bit more on, on Google Earth a little bit, but just to show you that this Mount Zion is this, well, this whole kind of hill here is called Mount Zion. And there's the Kidron Valley, which runs here to the east of the temple. And then um, this is the Mount of Olives. And on the other side of the Mount of Olives, there's Bethphage, which is, comes into play, especially in the triumphal entry. And then down kind of on this little hill that juts out is the city of Bethany. Now, Be this is a major um, place for us to consider, uh, especially in the chronology of Holy Week. So Bethany is the village where, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. And it's not that far. I mean, look, you see there's one mile. So this is maybe two miles or a mile and a half from Bethany to Jerusalem. But Bethany is the place where Jesus and the disciples were staying and were living during this Holy Week. So, so one of the things to, to note in the chronology of Holy Week is that every day Jesus and the disciples, they would wake up in Bethany and, and have their coffee and, and, uh, and their Jewish breakfast, eggs or whatever. And then they would travel into Jerusalem and then back to Bethany, into Jerusalem, back to Bethany, into Jerusalem, back to Bethany. So they're going back and forth on this path every day. The city of Jerusalem was swollen with people because the time was the time of the Passover. So, so that it was very crowded. And Jesus would, was in public um, a lot of times, was there in public uh, teaching but the, um, and there with the crowds, but he would retreat back over to Bethany so that, so the Pharisees didn't, didn't know where he was. So this trip is going to happen on Palm Sunday, then back on Holy Monday and Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday. We don't know what happened, but then maybe Judas went over to, to make a deal with the uh, Pharisees. Uh, but then, um, uh, and, but then Holy Thursday into, into Jerusalem and he'll, and he'll stay there as well. The other place maybe to note just on this map is the Garden of Gethsemane, which is it's on the other side of the Kidron, the Brook Kidron, uh, on the kind of lower side of the um, Mount of Olives. And this is a favorite place of Jesus and the disciples. Now, let, let me uh, maybe point out a couple other things while we're here on this map. One is to note that here's the, here's the temple. Um, and the temple in the ancient city of Jerusalem is on the what? It's on the north east side of Jerusalem. And the city kind of extends this way. It kind of goes south and, and west. One of the things that we'll note in, a, in just a little bit when we look at the modern city of Jerusalem, that this is the, when the Crusaders built the walls, they built the city kind of up this way. And so, uh, in fact, these kind of, these walls right here are kind of the rebuilt city. So the green is the is the medieval outline of the city, whereas the yellow is the old one. And that means that there's a lot of things, like for example, there's John's house, the house of Caiaphas, perhaps the upper room that are that would have been in the city and the time of Jesus, but they're outside of the city now. So let's see what, I'll, I got another picture just to make sure that we're uh, gonna be able to track it. Ah, oh, yeah, here, um, let me get rid of all my notes. It's another map of, um, of, uh, of Jerusalem and the events of Holy Week here. So you see the Mount of Olives, same sort of thing. So here's the, here is the, um, the Mount of Olives, Kidron Valley, and the upper city, and so forth and so on. So you can see the place where perhaps the crucifixion uh, might have happened here or maybe over here, just depending on the date. But you see the temple is here. The Palace of Pilate is here. Um, all the upper room stuff is down here. Now, I might, if I can, 
let me pause there and see if there's any questions that are coming up in the chat because what I might I might try to show us what this looks like uh, nowadays. Any questions or Evan? Let me see how how things are going over there with you. Everything looking good? Sure. Yeah, uh, we have one question in the chat, and just a reminder to everybody: uh, there's two ways to really participate. So feel free to enter any questions in the chat. Also, if you click the participants option on your menu, you should see a, an option at the bottom of that participants list to raise your hand and that'll let us know that you have a question. So the question from Paul is, when did the meal with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus take place? Probably, uh, probably that was the uh, uh, associated with the anointing of Jesus. And there, that's one of the trickiest problems in the chronology. Uh, but I have that on, um, on Saturday night before the triumphal entry. Um, the reason why it's a little bit tricky is because, so, so either Matthew and Mark have that event out of order or John has it out of order. In fact, let me see, I'll, I'll show you guys that. Um, how do I get there? Yes. Let me, let me just show you this on the chronology here. So if you can see that on the screen, um, and, and by the way, this, this slide uh, presentation we just made public. So you, if you want to get these notes and print them off or look at them, if you go to the website, uh, wolfmuller.co slash Bible, there'll be a link to this chart and to all the maps and everything that are there. So you can take a look at that. So you don't have to jot all these notes down. But, um, but one of the trickiest things in the chronology of Holy Week is this, the anointing by Mary at the Feast of Simon, probably at Mary's house, this, this particular event, where and when was it? And you'll notice that you have to go, that either Matthew and Mark have it out of place or that John has it out of place. So you got to make a decision and say, do I think it was later in the week with where Matthew and Mark put it? Or do I think it was, it was earlier in the week before the triumphal entry? And I've, I've opted to go with the, with the understanding that John is going to give us the proper chronological order, the anointing of the feet of Jesus, Simon's house uh, there, and that Matthew and Mark push it later in the week for theological reasons. They're going to say that it happened right before his death, but, but John is going to actually to kind of get the theology there. But I actually prefer the chronology all the time in John. It seems like John was writing later, and he really wanted to um, he really wanted to give us the sort of precise ordering of things so so that's what um so that's how i I answer that question. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, one more picture with maps now if you I'm going to switch to Google Earth so so don't so be ready for like a little tr um, kind of flying around here. It's kind of wild. Um, so don't get dizzy, but this gives you a, uh, this gives you a picture of, of the Holy land as it is now. Um, just a couple of things to, to note. So here you have the Mediterranean sea, you have the dead sea here, the Jordan river and the Jordan rift Valley comes down here. Here's the sea of Galilee up North. And so th this, this, is this modern Israel, this is the promised land here. You'll notice that the Dead Sea is very, very far. It's sunk. It's a hundred and it's a, a 1500 meters or below sea level. I mean, it's way down there. And there's this whole valley um, that, uh, that comes up, or sorry, the whole wilderness that sort of comes up from the Dead Sea to the region of Jerusalem. So you'll see down here, this kind of spot, that's Jericho, oldest city in the world. You see, the, uh, you see the river coming down. A lot of times, especially in the ancient world, the people would travel from up here in Galilee. They'd come down the valley. They'd come to Jericho. And it's in Jericho when you start heading up the mountain um, to, to get to Jerusalem. So here's Jerusalem. And we'll zoom in just a little bit. So here's Jerusalem. Whoop, boom. Let me see here. Yeah, here's the old city of Jerusalem. So see, you, you see the Temple Mount here, and here's the Mount of Olives here, and then coming over here, you see Bethphage, and then kind of coming along here, here's the tomb of Lazarus, 
that's going to give it's right here actually this is the wrong not note but this is the, somewhere in here is bethany and the and the house of mary martha and lazarus so that this so that holy week is marked let me just flip around from the other side so you can see it so here's the mount of olives here's jerusalem here's bethany over here so so um when jesus makes the triumphal entry he comes to bethphage he gets the donkey he comes down this little road right there and enters into the city of Jerusalem and then, and then back, he checks things out, then back. Then Holy Monday, Jesus is going to go back and cleanse the temple, curse the fig tree on the way back, and then back to Bethany. And then Holy Tuesday, same thing, travel all the way back. Holy Tuesday is the last day that Jesus teaches publicly in the temple. And then he's going to go back to Bethany so that this little path is the path that Jesus and the disciples were taking ev almost every day during, during Holy Week. So here's the spot for the triumphal entry uh, and so forth and so on. So that gives you a, a, a bit of a glimpse of it. Let me just flip around here and kind of hone in on a couple of other things. So you see the Mount of Olives here. Uh, you see the Garden of Gethsemane here. Uh, you see the... Um, current kind of here's the where the temple mount is the mosque is on top of it now and you and and this if you remember that picture this is where the walls were for the old city so so this place here is the traditional place for the upper room where the lord's supper happened uh this is the place where the, supposedly peter denied the lord jesus so this is all these are all happening right here on this mountain uh mount zion um, I think maybe one more thing. Here's the Garden of Gethsemane. So this kind of gives you a, a little bit of a view there. The Mount of Olives, the, the road where Jesus came down for the triumphal entry, so that when Jesus left the city, you get the idea that on the on on Palm or sorry on Monday Thursday, the, Jesus gave the Lord's Supper. Then he came through and he left the city. They went over to Gethsemane to pray. He was arrested. And then brought Brat back into the city, then probably back up here to Pilate. Maybe Herod was over here, and then back, and then the crucifixion. Um, there's two spots, maybe here, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, or right up here somewhere uh, on the map. So that gives you a a, a sense of um, that might give you a sense of where these things are on the map. Um, so let me let me just pause there for a minute. I like to. It's it's always nice. I don't know if it's nice for you guys to to be able to see these things, but I always like to I always like to get them uh, kind of placed in space and time. So hopefully that's helpful. Any questions uh, from there? No questions in the chat. Um, so let's are, go. Yep, I'm sorry. Oh, we are getting a little bit of lag on the connection. Um, so as a result of that, I may just shut off um, the audio, uh, sorry, the, uh, the video sharing. So maybe that'll help preserve some of the, the connection here. Okay, perfect. Um, so just to give an, uh, a kind of a broad then outline of, of Holy Week, we have a handful of things that are happening. Um, the triumphal entry uh, on, on Sunday and then back, and then Monday is going to be the cursing of the fig tree and the, and the cleansing of the temple, and then back to Bethany. And then Tuesday is the big day. Tuesday is the last day of, the public, of Jesus' public ministry. And on Holy Tuesday, Jesus teaches in the temple. Then he leaves the temple. He goes to the top of the Mount of Olives, and it's from there that he gives his, his discourse on uh, on the last days and so forth and so on. So the Mount, it's called the Olivet Discourse because it was on the Mount of Olives. Uh, and then that takes us all the way through. So I thought we might just sort of look at the chronology a little bit and then hone in on a couple of, of particular texts. So again, if you guys have questions or anything uh, that you're wondering about, uh, feel free to, to jump in or uh, uh, chat or ask those questions as well. But let's take a look at some of the chronology here. So we'll start on uh, we'll start on Holy Saturday again. We made a note already that um, that this is out of order, either in Matthew and Mark or in John. So you kind of have to give an option that you prefer for that. We have the anointing of Jesus, and this is this is where Jesus says that he's being anointed for burial. So already Jesus knows what's going to happen, even though the disciples are not quite there. 
And then on Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, we have the triumphal entry of Jesus. That's Bethany to Bethphage to Jerusalem and then back to Bethany. This is a key event where Jesus comes in fulfillment of the prophecy. And, and to note here that it's one of these, um, the triumphal entry of Jesus is one of the rare events that's recorded in all four Gospels. So to just simply make a note of that, that, that all four of them are giving us this, this, um, this traveling of Jesus uh, from Bethany into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah, see your king comes to you, uh, righteous and having salvation. And the, key, and the key thing for the triumphal entry is the lowliness of Jesus, the humility of Jesus. I mean, he doesn't come riding on an elephant or something fancy like that. He comes rather on a donkey, on the animal of peace, uh, which, is really, um, which is really wonderful. Uh, then we have, and, and the way that, and this is, again, the chronology is a little bit tricky, but one of the key ways that we're able to figure out what's happening on Monday and what's happening on Tuesday is this incident of cursing the fig tree. So Jesus is going to curse the fig tree. It's, it's not fig season. So Jesus is doing this as a preaching illustration, the cursing of the fig tree. But he's going to come and he's going to curse the fig tree on one day, and then they're going to walk past the fig tree on the next. So even though it seems like a small kind of point, this cursing of the fig tree is going to be one of the key things that helps us to, to date the chronology of this. And then Jesus goes and cleanses the temple. Now, one of the interesting things is that if you were just, for example, to read the Gospel of Matthew and, uh, and, and look at the cleansing of the temple, you might say, hey, look, at this! they happen one after another, the triumphal entry and the, um, and the cleansing of the temple. But, uh, but it's helpful to compare Mark there, who gives us the cursing of the fig tree, and that helps us to, to sort out that the cleansing of the temple happened on, on Holy Monday. One other note about the, about the uh, cleansing of the temple, and that is that it happens twice. So a lot, of people, um, a lot of people will say that either John, who has the cleansing of the temple right at the, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, or uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who have the cleansing of the temple at the end of Jesus' ministry, that one or the other is uh, wrong. But I think the, the simplest thing to do with this is to, is to simply consider that the cleansing of the temple happened twice. Uh, once at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, the cleansing of the temple occurred, and, uh, and then once at the very end on Holy Monday. And that helps us too, because the accounts in John and the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or at least in, in Matthew and Luke, are, are different enough that they seem like different incidences. Uh, and then Jesus is teaching, and then he returns to Bethany. So those are the events of, um, what, that's, those are the events of, of, uh, of Holy Monday. Uh, next, Holy Tuesday. So the very next day, and this is, things are going to get even more intense. Let me make sure I can move to the next thing. Boop. Holy Tuesday. Um, yes. So here's, uh, so, so Jesus goes back to Bethany on Monday. He comes back to Jerusalem on Holy Tuesday. And this is where we have this event of the withered fig tree. So Jesus curses the fig tree on Monday. And then on Tuesday, they're walking by and they notice, wow, look at how uh, the tree is withered. It's gone now. And then Jesus preaches about how the people weren't ready for his visitation. And that also helps us get this Bethany to Jerusalem thing down. Getting a note that we got a couple of questions, Evan? Yeah, we got our, a couple of questions here. First one is from VJ Samuel. Uh, why did Jesus curse the fig tree of not bearing any fruits when this wasn't the season for figs? Yeah. This, um, let me see, what text do we want to look at? In Matthew 20, the, Jesus is going to explain it. I bet you it's more explained in Mark. Let me just pull up Mark uh, chapter 11 and read what it says there. So Mark 11, 19 to 26 is going to give it to us. Uh, when evening had come, he went out of the city. 
Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have authority against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive. In heaven, uh, in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Oh, no, Jesus doesn't explain it there. Oh, sorry. So let me go to the Matthew text. I thought this was explained a little bit further, so I might have to punt on this question, but let's see. And uh, so Matthew 21, 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so quickly? And so Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what is done to the fig tree, but if you say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it'll be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Ah, okay. D Jesus didn't explain. I'm sorry. Is someone in the chat? No, I thought that Jesus... I thought that Jesus explained that this cursing of the fig tree was connected to his weeping over Jerusalem and the fact that he, when he came into Jerusalem and was looking for faith but didn't find any, uh, and so Jerusalem, because they didn't receive this, the time of their visitation, um, uh, was, uh, was going to now be cursed there. I'm going to come back to this question, guys. I'm sorry. That's not as a, that's not a, I'm not satisfied with that, with that answer that I'm giving you. Any, are there other questions, Evan? Yeah, we've got another one here from Sahar Sadlovsky. Um, do you think there's a connection with the meaning of the name Bethany, which means in Hebrew, house of the poor, and what happened to be there as he headed to his forthcoming death? Uh, I don't, I didn't know that, Sahar. Is, is it, um, but I might ask Sahar about that if he has questions. Is it possible to get Sahar and, and jump him on and he can say a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, Sahar, do you want to do you do you want to give us some of those things? Um, um, yeah, I mean, we see. I mean, I just noticed from uh, from your presentation that Jesus happened to be a lot in Bethany as he is preparing to his humiliated forthcoming death. And we know that as we enter to the Holy Week, this is the humiliation of Jesus coming to its climax. So. And I know in Hebrew that the word uh, Bethany is the house of poor. So I wonder if there is a connection uh, that he happened to be there as he is heading toward his humiliation because he is the true in spirit. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? That So, I mean, another option for Jesus would have been to, um, to stay in Bethlehem, which was where he was born which means house of bread, but he doesn't. It, it is in Bethany, which is a little bit closer. The reason they're in Bethany, as far as I can tell, is precisely because um, that's where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. And Jesus uh, has this deep affection for that family. So there's these close ties between Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Jesus, and the disciples. So we remember, for example, that that one of the reasons Jesus came back from Galilee down to Jerusalem was to raise Lazarus from the dead. And that it was the resurrection of Lazarus that got the, the Sanhedrin and all the rulers in, in Jerusalem. Um, it, it hardened their heart to kill Jesus. So coming back, so, uh, and you, and you remember that they hear, they send word to Jesus, Lazarus is sick. And, uh, and the, the disciples are hesitant because they said, last time you were in Jerusalem, they tried to kill you. But Jesus says, no, we're going to go back and see Lazarus. And that's where Thomas says, well, if we die, we die. So, you know, so be it. So we're going to go. But I don't know. I, it could be. I wonder, I wonder how poor a place Bethany was. If it was particularly, um, you know, it's kind of like the, the bad side of town. Uh, I don't know. So all the, you know, the rich and the wealthy are living in town and the poor are living outside of town. I do know that it, this seems to be a, always a, just a true phenomenon, is that even in the ancient world, just like today, that in the inner city, like in the city walls, 
you have the very wealthy and the very poor. And then in the suburbs, you have sort of the middle class. So, so there was a sub suburbia in Jerusalem and in ancient Jerusalem. And, and then you have all these little villages that are around that are kind of the, you know, middle class places. So I don't know if at this time, Bethany would have been down and out. If someone knows more about that, that's great. But to connect these events with the humiliation of Jesus is exactly right because, um, because this whole week is going to be an exercise in humility. Fantastic. Thank you guys. This is really good. Any other questions? We're going to go back to the slide for Tuesday. Are we okay? Uh, just one more question sure. um, from Joseph Turner. It looks like all the gospels, but John include the events of Holy Tuesday. Is there a reason John left these things out? Well, this is um, when you compare so mostly, and this, this is an old tradition from Eusebius, maybe? Wow. That, that John, who was the, the disciple who lived the longest, he was the only disciple not to be martyred. He died in old age, although he was exiled in Patmos and things like this. And that the church was, in fact, almost begging him to write a gospel and he put it off, put it off, put it off. That's why we have the idea that gospel, that John came really late, but that John wrote his gospel with the understanding that the other gospels were in possession of the church. So that John assumes that you have a copy of Matthew and Luke or Mark and Matthew, or that you have access to the other gospels. And so John is written almost as a supplement to those other to those other gospels. So most of the things that John includes are not included in the other gospels. So, so the, the thing that is perhaps most interesting is not to note where John doesn't include, um, uh, that John doesn't in include the, um, uh, the things, but rather to note where John does. So if John does include something that the other gospels include, he's really highlighting the importance of that. But John, for example, doesn't have the temptation of Jesus or the baptism of Jesus or the institution of the Lord's Supper um, because he assumes that you have all of those things already from the other Gospels. So, uh, Andrew sent me a nice uh, note in the chat like uh, from the study Bible on the, on the cleansing of the temple and the fig leaves that says, like a fig leaf with... Well, like a fig tree with leaves, the temple compound was full of activity. Fruit should have been present, but both the tree and the temple were barren. That's kind of a nice point for there. Okay, let's get on to Holy Tuesday, um, because this is a big, big day, and I want to look at a couple of texts in, in this day. But so Holy Tuesday, Bethany to Jerusalem, and then uh, you have a number of events that are going to happen in Jerusalem. So the challenge of Jesus by the Sanhedrin, his answer in parables, uh, and then the three questions that happen in the temple where they, they try to test Jesus, uh, the greatest tribute to Caesar and the resurrection and the greatest commandments. And then this is a key, key text that I, I hope we'll be able to look at where Jesus, uh, they ask these three questions of Jesus and he's silenced. There's a little note that says they, they, they couldn't, stump him. And then Jesus is going to turn around and he's going to ask them a question. Um, and he's going to silence them as well. And then you see Jesus leaving. The, the famous story of the widow's might um, is here in on Holy Tuesday as Jesus is leaving uh, the temple. And then he travels to the top of Mount Olives and he's going to tell, he's going to give his famous, what we call the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus teaching on the end times, talking about the crucifixion. Uh, and then this, and I'm not sure if I have this right or not. Um, perhaps you guys have thoughts on this, but the question of when Judas does this, when Judas contracts to betray Jesus is, a, is an open question. I used, to, I used to be convinced for whatever reason that it was on Holy Tuesday, and I'm more and more convinced that it happened on Holy Wednesday, but I can't ever remember why I get convinced of these things. So I have a couple of texts for us to consider here. Um, first from Matthew 21, uh, and just to look at this. So when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching. And he said, 
by what authority do you uh, uh, do you do these things, especially cleansing the temple? By what authority? Now, Jesus answered them, and, and uh, what I want to kind of highlight this here is that a lot of times when Jesus answers, he, he's getting to the deeper point of the question that was even asked. But I think this is a text that we often pass over very quickly, and we kind of miss what Jesus is, is getting at. So they're saying, who ordained you? How can you come in here and overthrow the temple and say these things? And Jesus says, I'll ask you guys a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. And then Jesus asks about John the Baptist. Now, this is amazing. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? In other words, Jesus says, okay, I'll answer your question. If you guys answer a question that I've got. Did, when John was out there baptizing and preaching in the wilderness, was he doing so as a prophet of God or as a, simply as a false prophet, as a man? Was he from God or was he not? What about John? And they discussed it. Now watch what happens. So Jesus asked this question, and they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, then he'll say to us, why did you not believe him? Because after all, he preached to me. But if we say from man, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we don't know. Now, now look, this is an amazing sort of thing to see, is that they, they refused to answer the question because, I mean, they they thought that he was a false teacher, that John was a false teacher, but they refused to answer because they're, they're politically motivated. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But what I want, what I want to connect, especially in this text, is that the authority of Jesus is connected to the baptism of John. The, this is just one of these things that's often kind of missed in our study of the, of the scriptures, is that Jesus was anointed. He was christened. He was ordained. And his ordination was his baptism. And so Jesus is saying, look, I, it's true that I wasn't made a rabbi by one of your rabbis. I wasn't made a teacher by one of your teachers. But I was given this authority, the prophetic office, and even the office of Christ, when John baptized me. So that, so that Jesus is connecting the authority to cleanse the temple and to preach these things to the baptism that he received from John. This important theological uh, text that comes right there in the middle of Holy Week. So let me pause with that, and we'll, we'll look at some other texts as well, but um, see if anybody has questions or thoughts about that. Just uh, one question, um, or a couple of questions here, actually. One question from Josiah. Uh, how did Matthew, Mark, and Luke get the story of Judas's betrayal to the Pharisees? Oh, that's a great question. And I had not thought of that, Josiah. That's fantastic. Um, two options. I'm going to, but I'm just now, I'm just guessing. Um, the first option is this, that we simply remember that the, the, authors were of the Holy Scriptures were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So there's a number of times where, where they know of things that they otherwise, that they did not see. It's one of the interesting differences between the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John, is that John gives us almost only, almost exclusively things that he saw with his own eyes. There's like two or maybe three exceptions to that. So that one of the things that we note in the Gospel of John is that things like the temptation of Jesus when he's alone with the devil in the wilderness are not included because John wasn't an eyewitness of those things. Also the birth of Jesus and so forth. So, um, so the Gospels will give us um, accounts of things that happened that the Gospels writers didn't see. Now, some, that, uh, some of that they learned by investigation, like Luke says that he went and he investigated these things and we think a lot of the things that Luke wrote about, he learned from Mary. But we also know that the Lord can simply inspire them uh, to give these accounts. Um, so, that's, so that could be one possibility. I wonder if there was other, uh, another possibility could be that, that um, some, of, some of those, we know that some of the people involved in the temple, both some of the priests and also some of the Pharisees, uh, later um, 
became Christian. And so maybe they had that in, inside information. And we'll have to look as we go through here if John uh, gives us some of the inside information, because John was particularly well-connected with the temple and with the family of the high priest in Jerusalem. So those are my stabs at answers, but that's a great question, Josiah. Uh, Evan, you got to screen these questions to make sure they're not so hard, especially Josiah has hard questions. So there's a, was there another one? Uh, there's one here. Yeah, we have another one here. This, this one's more of an observation um, from Jeff, or actually Jeff's iPhone had this observation. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the Pharisees' answer to Jesus' question is the same as Jesus' answer to the Pharisees. Um, I don't know. I don't understand what that means. Um, Jesus, so can you read it again, Evan? Sorry. Sure. The, the Pharisees' answer to Jesus' question is the same as Jesus' answer to the Pharisees. Hmm. I'm not sure of the... I'm not sure either. Uh, Jeff, if you could clarify, that would be... Uh, that's great, but I appreciate but, jumping in. One here from Justin. Um, what information would Jesus have provided to the apostles after his resurrection of things they did not witness? That, that is an interesting question also. It seems like um, we, we have the, the accounts of the, of the conversations between Jesus and the other disciples is, is scant. So we don't have a lot of the, of, the, of the conversations recounted for us. There's a couple of things to note, though. One is that a lot of things that Jesus told them before his death and resurrection they understand after. So for example, when Jesus said, tear down the temple, I'll build it in three days. And then after the resurrection, they understood what he was talking about. So there's a lot of things that Jesus said before his death and resurrection that, that didn't make sense until after the resurrection. But there's also a lot of conversations that are missing, just the scriptures don't give it to us, that Jesus had when he met with his disciples in Galilee. So you'll remember, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit next week for the events of, of, um, of Easter, but you'll remember that, that the angels and even, yeah, the angels who appear to the women after the resurrection of Jesus, they say, go to Galilee and meet him there. Go to Galilee. Tell the disciples, go to Galilee. Go to get, he'll meet you in Galilee. There he'll see you. But they don't go to Galilee. Jesus appears to them in Jerusalem on Easter Sunday, and then a week later in Jerusalem, a week after Easter, and only then, maybe a week or 10 days after the resurrection, do they go up to Galilee. But there's this importance, almost kind of, I mean, there's, a, there's an extreme importance that Jesus will give to the going to Galilee. And, and, and I don't know exactly why, but it seems like there was a lot of things that Jesus wanted to, to teach them. So let's go up to Galilee where we'll have some time, and I'll, and I'll give you what you need to know there. Uh, but we just don't know what those conversations um, are happening. So we, we, don't, we don't know what, um, what are happening. The, the scriptures just don't give it to us. So very good. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, that's all the questions in the chat for now. Uh, we, got, I'm gonna keep, we got about 15 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe move through a couple of things here a little bit quickly because we're only on Tuesday. Um, Here's another, just to notice that, that Jesus, oops, I didn't share it all the way, that Jesus is tested by the Sadducees. And then one of the very key texts is, um, is this conversation. This is on Holy Tuesday, where Jesus is, um, is teaching in the temple, and, and they've asked him the three questions. They've, and Jesus has answered them. The question about the greatest commandment, the question about giving taxes to Caesar and the question about um, whose wife will the, the lady be who married the seven brothers and they all died without children, etc. So the, all those questions are answered. And now Jesus is going to ask them a question. He's going to fire back. And this is a riddle and it's really beautiful. He says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. This is so, there's no question about this. The son of David, this is from 2 Samuel 7, where David is promised that the Messiah would sit on his throne forever. And then he says, okay, well, I got a question for you. How is it that David in the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I 
until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, this is Psalm um, 110, verse 1. And it is the uh, third most quote, if you can believe it, if I said, what are the most quoted Old Testament texts in the New Testament? I, I'm not sure what you would um, what you would say, but this is the third most quoted. The first most quoted is uh, Leviticus 19, love your neighbors yourself. And the, uh, and the second most quoted is Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. But this is the third one, and it's quoted over and over. And to note a couple of things about the text. So number one, when it says here, Lord, whoops, the first Lord, that's the divine name. If you look in Psalm 110 in the Old Testament, it has all capitals. That's the name uh, Yahweh. So Yahweh said to my Lord. Now, who is that my there? That my is David. So, so this is the setup for the riddle. So it says, Yahweh said to David's Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, this is one of these beautiful times in the Old Testament that we have a conversation between the Father and the Son. And the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So the my there, let's see if we can get some different colors. The my is the Father and the your is the Son. So it's the father to the son. But look at what David, and this is what Jesus is highlighting on. Look at what David calls the son, the Christ. He calls him my Lord. So then David, so then Jesus says, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now, now one of the amazing things about this text, there, there's so many amazing things just about this particular text right here. I mean, so fantastic. I mean, one of them is that Psalm 110 is answering an old and ancient riddle already in itself. So Psalm 110 is, is answering the riddle, how can the Messiah be both the king and the priest? Because if you're the king, you're from David, and if you're the priest, you're from Levi. And that's so, so those two totally different tribes, Judah and Levi. So how can you be both? And Psalm 110 is answering that riddle by saying, that the priesthood of the Messiah comes not from Aaron or from Levi, but rather from Melchizedek. Fantastic. So you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. But Jesus hones in on another riddle in the text. And he says, how can you be both David's son and David's Lord? Ah, oh, fantastic. And look at what happens. No one is able to answer him. Now, we don't know if they're we don't know if they're, if they're able to answer him because they didn't know or because they were afraid. But look at what happens. It says, from that day on, no one dared, him ask, dared ask him any more questions so that, so that they, they can't answer Jesus. They don't know what to say. They're showing themselves to not be competent teachers of the Lord's word because they can't answer this question here. Uh, and so they, they're not going to try to trick Jesus anymore or to confuse him. And this, by the way, this moment right here, th this, this place in the scriptures is going to be the last, uh, the last moment of Jesus' public teaching. So from this moment on, Jesus leaves the temple. He goes to the Mount of Olives. He teaches his disciples. And then the next time he's in Jerusalem, it's for the Passover for the Lord's Supper, for the institution of the Lord's Supper, and then for the unfolding events of Holy Week. So, so this is an important, it's a key moment in the Gospels. Now, now we, though, know the answer to the question, and this is what's so cool. How can, David, how can Jesus be both David's son and David's Lord? Well, it's because he's, uh, he's true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary. So that Jesus is, uh, is God and man. He's the son of David according to his divine nature, and he's the, and he's the Lord of David according to his, true, uh, according to his divine nature. So it, did I say that right? He's David's Lord according to his divine nature, and he's David's son according to his human nature. Yeah, it's just a fantastic, fantastic text. Okay. Uh, I'm worried to ask if we have questions because I know we're going to, 
we have like five minutes left and we're only on Tuesday. Um, but anything coming up there, Evan, in the chat? No, we're good. I think you answered so, them all. So let's press, let, if, let's just press through with an outline of these events and so that we cover it all. And then, um, and then we'll see where we want to go from there. If we want to, if we want to dig in a little bit further uh, next week, or if we want to, um, uh, if we want to uh, move on to to another topic, you guys can let me know uh, there. So let's go to um, let's go to Holy Wednesday. We can do that day pretty quick. No events recorded, or perhaps this is the time when Judas goes into Jerusalem and he contracts the betrayal. It was always a question for me about why Jesus had to be betrayed. Like, why didn't they just grab him? But remember, they were afraid of the crowds and the people were listening to Jesus. And one of the big dramas of Holy Week is what direction are the crowds going to go? The Sanhedrin, that, that is the ruling elders of Israel, are dead set on killing Jesus. Pilate is trying to release him. But what, what way are the crowds going to go? And Pilate thinks the crowds are on Jesus' side. After all, they sang Hosanna. They seem to like Jesus and so forth, but they're going to, that's all going to change. So on Thursday, they go into Jerusalem. They have the Passover, uh, and all these events are going to be um, noted for us in the Gospels. We have Jesus washing his disciples' feet in John. Uh, the prediction of the betrayal, the institution of the Lord's Supper, that's all happening in the upper room, perhaps in the house of Mark. It's an interesting theory, and it has a lot to, uh, a lot to commend it. Uh, Jesus' last speech, uh, his final discourse, and so forth, that should be chapter 14 to chapter 17, verse 26. Uh, so there's a little typo there, but that's a, a long uh, conversation that Jesus has. Uh, and then we're into the um, Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus, after nightfall, they sing a hymn and they leave the upper room and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. We saw where that was on, on the map. Uh, and then Jesus is arrested. He's betrayed. His disciples desert him. That's all on the Mount of Olives. And then they go back into the city. Now there's five trials of Jesus. And this took me a while. I don't know why. I, I just never knew this. Um, until I, probably my first Holy Week as a pastor to try to sort this out. Because there, you'll notice that there's, for example, different marks in the different Gospels of all these things. So you got to put these all together. But you have five trials of Jesus. So you have his first trial, and his, that's his examination by Annas. And then you have his trial by Caiaphas. Look, if I do Roman numerals, that's a lot easier. And then it doesn't look like a three-year-old. So the trial by Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, Jesus is slapped on the face. He's mocked and so forth. This is in the context of Peter's denial. Jesus is then condemned by the Sanhedrin, and he's taken to Pilate. Early in the morning, on Friday morning, Jesus appears before Pilate. Um, and he has his first appearance before Pilate. And then he goes before Herod. Remember, Herod was the ruler of Galilee in the north. And remember also that this Herod is... Um, it's not Herod the Great, but it's his son who rules up north. This is the Herod who beheaded John the Baptist and so forth. So not the Herod who killed the children, this, the whole Herod family. But he, Herod was down from the north in Galilee for the Passover. So Pilate hears that Jesus is from Galilee, and he sends him over to Herod. Notice that this Jesus before Herod is only in the Gospel of Luke. So that's where that happens. And then um, Jesus says nothing, nothing to Herod. So he goes back, and now he appears before Pilate. He's mocked. He's beaten. In fact, Pilate beats Jesus for the reason of trying to let them release him. But, um, but it doesn't, but doesn't work. The, cry, the crowds cry out for him so that Jesus is then uh, led to Golgotha outside the city. Remember, crucifixions were always happening by the door of the city. It's like a, it's like a billboard. Hey, don't commit these crimes when you come into our town. So they take him outside the city to, to Calvary. Um, the, oh, there's too many things. So let's just very quickly review. This is, just deserves a lot more time, but I'll commend these texts to you and to your families. But we have Jesus is crucified from 9 a.m., to 3 p.m. There's seven words from the cross. Uh, Luke is going to give us three of them. 
Uh, John is going to give us three of them, and Matthew and Mark are going to give us only only one. So we can track the words of Jesus uh, in this way from the cross, um, from from noon until until three. Uh, G, the, the darkness covers the land, and so this is going to be the key time uh, there. And we have the, this cry of dereliction right at the end of that. This is going to be the key moment in the Gospels, in the life of Jesus, um, in, and, in, um, and in these events. Look at how it's given it like it's a time event there. Eloi. And then we have the last three words of Jesus again, and then his death and all the things that follow. Uh, the death of Jesus. So, um, so that's going to take us then uh, to the to the very end of all of these particular uh, particular events. The, there's the request that the legs are broken, the piercing of Jesus' side because he was already found dead. That's given to us in John. The requests of Jesus' body. Note that that's given to us in all four of the Gospels. Um, and the, the, this is an important note, also by the way, apologetically, that they watch the place where Jesus is buried so that they know uh, where that's, uh, where that's happening. Uh, oof, we're over time guys. And I didn't want to do that, but uh, let's just make sure um, that they seal the guard. The tomb is sealed. All these things are happening there uh, after that as well. So, so there's, I'm sorry we had to go through so quickly through that. Uh, that's my own fault, but uh, the, the, these are the, perhaps the most important things. And I would commend to you, uh, if you get the slide, you can download the PDF and to read these things from the different spots um, throughout, throughout the week. Okay, um, Evan, how are we doing on the questions? Uh, we do have a couple questions if we have time for them. What this is maybe what I would suggest is this okay? Because I don't want to I don't want to um, disrespect people's time and the importance of um, their own schedule. But so what if we say a closing prayer and a benediction, and then if people want to hang around for fifteen or twenty minutes uh, for a, a little more Q and A, that'd be fine. And everyone else who needs to go and get after it can go and get after it. How's that sound? Sounds good. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for your. Um, for your life and for your death uh, that you suffered for us so that we might stand before you as your own dear children. We thank you for uh, this last week of your earthly ministry. And we pray that this Holy Week, you would bless us by, cons by our considering of these things, that we would have great joy that all that you did then was done for us. For we ask this all through through you, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Well, thanks everyone for, for joining us uh, here um, and for being part of the fun. It's great. I, uh, all the information will be, I'd, so I'd, I'd love your feedback. So if you go to wolfmuller.co slash contact you can let me know how you thought this went if it was helpful if it wasn't how we could do it different how we could do it better um i think from what i can tell this seems like it might be a fun idea at least for this time of quarantine so we'll put up all the information all the most current information will be on the website so if you go to wolfmuller.co slash bible you should be able to download this and, and see the study download the notes for the next studies and and to get the links so if you just bookmark that page That'll always have the most up-to-date information. And thanks, Evan, for, uh, for doing the hosting and everything else. So thanks, guys, so much. If you got to run, that's great. If you want to stick around for a few minutes, we can do some more Q&A. Uh, All right, Evan, I'm ready. All right, first one up from B. Stickless. Would they have eaten lamb at the Passover, seeing that they celebrated it early? And the lambs would not have yet been slaughtered. That's a great question. There, so there's a big question about the chronology of, of when was the lamb sacrificed versus when was the uh, Passover eaten and when was Jesus sacrificed. And, um, and th these, there's a lot of details that go into that. 
Um, my uh, and I always forget them every year. I have to go and look them up. I probably should have done that uh, today, uh, except for my. You know, the book I love on this is Andrew Steinman's chronology, and he he does a, some great work on that. But I think when we hear that they're eating the Passover meal before the Lord's Supper, that that would have been the Passover meal with the Seder meal with the lamb and everything else like that. Um, and then the sacrifice uh, that was happening was that there were sacrifices that happened all every day during the week of the Passover. So that there's kind of an initial feast right at the beginning of the celebration of Passover. And then there's lambs being slaughtered all through the week as they're celebrating this. So that's just off the top of my head what I remember, but I think they would have been eating lamb, which then brings to this really interesting point is that when Jesus took the bread, he says, this is my body. He didn't take the lamb, which would have been a, probably a better symbol. If Jesus was giving us a symbolic meal, he would have said, this is my body given for you. And he would have given him the lamb, but instead he gave him the bread. So that's just a, a particularly interesting little detail. Cool. Another one here from Aaron Patterson. Um, what are your thoughts on the idea that it being two different crowds present in this Holy Week, one that rejoiced in his entry and the different crowd that screamed for his death? So was it the same crowd, two different crowds? Well, it, should, it would have been certainly uh, different E. I mean, they certainly were different. Even if they were the same people, it was a very different crowd. So, And it's, it's one of these kind of studies in, in sort of crowd mentality because the crowd that's there on during the triumphal entry is crying hosanna hosanna a lot of that crowd i think it's the gospel of john tells us a lot of that crowd was from bethany and they they were there they were friends of mary martha and lazarus and they traveled into jerusalem with jesus whereas probably a lot of the crucify him crucify him crowd was the jerusalem crowd so you get a little bit of that but it does seem like I mean, in my reading of the, of the text, that when Pilate looks out at the crowd that's gathered for the spectacle of the, of the trial of Jesus, that Pilate gets the sense that the people don't want Jesus to be crucified, just the Pharisees. In fact, it's John that tells us that Pilate knew that they handed him over because of jealousy, because they were jealous of how much attention Jesus was getting from the crowds. And so there's a way... It's very, very interesting. There's a way that, that Pilate misreads the crowd, but maybe not. You know, Pilate thinks that, there's, that, that the crowds are going to cry for Jesus' release. That's why he, he beats Jesus and then presents him, behold the man, and then says, you have a custom, who should I release? A, a diff, the opposite order. But, and so Pilate thinks that the crowds are going to cry out for Jesus. And, and it says that they cried out for for Barabbas because they were stirred up by the Pharisees. So you get the picture of the Pharisees going through the crowd, getting them worked up to cry out for Jesus. So yeah, I don't, that's kind of a long winded answer of saying, we don't know a hundred percent, but it is, it is true that the crowd that's crying Hosanna uh, and the crowd that's crying crucify, that's, that's, they're, they're headed totally opposite directions. Right, so the wolves had a kind of a follow-up question to the answer on to one of the questions on the on the fig tree. Um, so part of the response was about the moving of the mountain. Is this where some get the idea that we can proclaim the virus away, mm. referring to the current situation? Yeah. So Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you say to the mountain, "Go into the sea," and it'll fall into the sea. Jesus teaches that a couple of times in his own ministry. Um, that's misinterpreted by the kind of the prosperity gospel teachers where they, they kind of name it, claim it sort of thing is that you can change reality by your words or by your faith. Like this is the Joel Osteen idea that faith is like the substance that changes the contours of reality. Um, we, it's better for us to understand faith as a reliance on the promises of God. And so when Jesus says, if you have faith, you can say to the mountain, go here or there. What he's saying is that if you have a promise that you believe, God will keep it. So that our prayer is based on these promises. So that if God promised that the coronavirus would end today, then we would pray with faith in that promise and the, and the coronavirus would go away. The dangerous thing is that we want, to, we want to take the promises of God where he hasn't given us a promise. So we want to say, oh, the Lord 
um, I'm going to claim something that the Lord hasn't promised us. So it's, it, we have to be very careful because the Lord has promised us that we'll have trouble. He has promised us that there'll be, that there'll be plagues and pestilences all, all the way through human history, that we live in this fallen world. And so when we start trying to, tr- trying to uh, claim away uh, disease or when we, try, when we start trying to claim health, um, we're, we're tempting God because we're, we are demanding that he keep a promise that he hasn't given. All right, a question from Lois Anderson. Were there any recorded comments concerning those who were raised from the tombs at the moment of the death of Jesus? Now, I, that's such a mysterious text to me. I still don't exactly know what to do with it. It's, this is a reference to the, um, to the event that, that it says that when Jesus died, there was an earthquake, tombs were opened, and some of the dead started walking around Jerusalem when Jesus was raised. It's like three days later. So it's this wild thing. And I just, I need to, I need to look into uh, that a little bit more. But as far as I know, that's the only mention of it. It doesn't, it's not mentioned. It's only mentioned, I believe, in Matthew. Um, and not in any of the other Gospels. I'm just looking. Yeah, Matthew 27 52 to 53 is the only mention of that. It's not mentioned anywhere else in the scriptures. It's, it's in a very mysterious text. So to answer Lois's question, not that I know of. I don't know any uh, sort of accounting, and I don't even quite know what to do with it. That it it's, it's almost like the, the death of Jesus and his resurrection is like a mini end of the world. So all these things that happen at the end of the world, like a little, it's like a little, it's like a crumb falls from the table. So, so all the things that happen at the end of time, when all the dead are raised, and when, and when all the mountains fall over, and when the whole earth shakes, it's just like a little, it's, it's like when, um, it's like when my mom was making cookies, and she gives me a little bite of the cookie dough. (laughs) That's, it's like the end of the world, you get a little bite of the end of the world when Jesus dies. That's the, that's the only way I know how to handle that. Thank you for that question. Cool. Uh, should I keep going or? Sure. Right. Well, how are we doing on time here? Yeah, maybe five more minutes. Is that all right? Okay. All right. One here from uh, Josiah. Do you think John's account of Peter's denial is an eyewitness account, or do you think it was one of the rare exceptions that you mentioned? John's uh, of Peter's denial. No, I think John was there. In fact, I know John was there because it was it was John because John was known to the family of the high priest that John could get into the courtroom of the high priest's house. So John is explicitly there and sees Peter deny. He's the threefold denial and the, and the, and the rooster crowing twice. Uh, yeah, we know that John was there for that. Ha ha! <laughs> That's a question from Josiah that I know the answer to. I got a question here that came to me on the chat. It said, what should our mood be on Good Friday? Should we go about as if nothing happened or should we commemorate it in a special way? This is a, this is a great question. Um, one of the things, so we talked a little bit at the very beginning about how the liturgy kind of gives us these events in real time. But, but we always know, always, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So one of the things that we don't want to do on Good Friday is pretend like, we don't want to try to pretend like we don't know that Jesus is raised from the dead. Like I, I, sometimes I think we're tempted to, to be like, oh, today's the day Jesus died. And we, and like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it said, we had hoped that he was the one, but now they had lost hope. So we kind of, we, we treat Good Friday as like a reenactment of the suffering of Jesus. And, um, and this is not, so we, we, there's, so there's no play acting in the church. There's no, there's no pretending in the church. So we celebrate Good Friday with the full knowledge that Jesus went to the cross for us and that he rose from the grave for us all willingly and for our own life and salvation. So we should know that this is a good Friday and we should rejoice in it as the most precious day of the year. Uh, But we should, but also it's not like then on like every other Friday we forget. So always good Friday. I mean, every Friday we remember the Lord's death. Every day we remember the Lord's death. Every day we remember his resurrection. 
I got an, Evan, do you have, I got another good question on my chat. How did John, a fisherman from Galilee, have a relationship with the high priest's family from Gordon? Which is a great question. And probably what it means is that Zebedee, John's father, who was well known to the high priest, was probably a wealthy man, had a home. He had a home in Jerusalem. That comes into play, especially in the chronology of Easter. And so probably he had a fleet of fishing boats. So, so you got maybe think of Zebedee as like a, a businessman who had a fishing operation on the Sea of Galilee. So he would have had a, 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 probably multiple boats, a big crew, house in Jerusalem, well involved and well connected. So, that, so we think of, when we think of the humility of the fishermen, it's probably right when it comes to Peter. But James and John were probably, I mean, they were probably working their father's business. Uh, but he was, he was also, though, well known to the high priest. So, We got a couple here. I don't know if you want to. Sure. Let's maybe right. one more. And, one then, more. and then we'll probably, you guys send me these questions and maybe we can take them up at the end next week too. All right. Uh, here's the last one um, from Rick Stengel. For what crime was Jesus executed for, according to Pilate, or was it just due to the pressure of the of the crowd? Right, great question. So, um, it's what's interesting is to notice what uh, what Jesus is accused of in his Jewish trial, and what crimes Jesus is accused of in his Roman trial. So, in the Jewish trial, they brought remember all these witnesses, but they couldn't agree on anything. Um, Finally, they did find one guy who said he said he'd tear down the temple and build it up in three days, which is true. Jesus did say that, but they couldn't even get their story straight on, the, on that accusation that Jesus told. I mean, it really actually happened. So then Jesus says, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, and that's when the high priest tears his thing. So Jesus has to almost give them the reason to condemn them. I mean, he speaks the truth about who he is, the Messiah who will judge the world, the son of God. And that's when they condemn him and they bring him to Pilate. And then, uh, and the accusation when they get before Pilate has to do with Jesus being a king. So that's why Pilate questions him, says, are you a king then? And king of the Jews and so forth. So it switches from the son of God to the king of kings and the question of kings. And the thing that really gets Pilate worried is when the Jews say, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, man. So, so they're saying he makes himself out to be a king. Anyone who says he's a king is no friend of Caesar and so forth. And so that's really the accusation that they're trying to level against Jesus before Pilate. Um, but, but Jesus also says who he is to Pilate. And that's when Pilate is afraid. When Jesus says that he's um, the son of God, that you have no power. Uh, to condemn me unless it's given to you from above. And he says, where are you from? And then Jesus doesn't say anything else. Um, so Pilate washes his hands, you remember? So Pilate says, I declare him innocent. I'm not finding him to be guilty at all. So Jesus is, mm, Jesus is never officially condemned for any particular crime by Pilate. In fact, he writes the king of the Jews above him, and they say, change it to, he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I've written, I've written. But Pilate basically hands Jesus over to the crowds to be crucified so that it's a, it's a bit of a lynch mob uh, action, the condemnation of Jesus um, by the crowds, but he hands him over and he lets his soldiers do that work that, that's there. So the official condemnation by the Jews is that he made himself to be the son of God. Uh, the official condemnation from Pilate, as close as we can get, would be the king of the Jews. And that's great. These are great questions, guys. So uh, we got we got to stop at some point. I mean, we could do this all day. This, is, but I think we probably should. We'll stop now. But let's do it again next Tuesday. Uh, hopefully, this is great. I want to take up the topic of hope. I think we probably need that more than ever in our days. And so, thinking of just doing a study on the biblical doctrine of hope for a while, and then a couple of people asked about the Book of Revelation, so that we might then do a. Um, a, a little overview of the book of Revelation, but I, I really would love your feedback. So if you send that feedback, wolfmuller.co slash contact, and you can give me the feedback on what you thought about class today and, and suggestions you have going forward. And hopefully this is a place where our families can gather around, you know, your kids who are now homeschooling. This can be a, 
uh, thing and, and for your friends and fan, anyone who wants to jump in, that's great. So, so thanks so much. And Evan, thanks for hosting. Of course. Thanks everybody. Yep. God's peace be with you.